Something that's really amazing about the soundtrack in the Metroid Prime games is how it manages to combine the new and the old to create this definitive sci-fi sound. On the one hand, you have theremin-esque noises that call back to the classic alien sci-fi of the 60s, a sound that most people associate with the genre. <laughs> This sort of sound, though, is also considered a little corny and cheesy by today's standards. But in Prime, it's elevated and given gravitas by being merged with dark alien chants and distorted vocals. The theremin notes provide that alien association with the rest of the track modernizing it, corrupting this classic sound and giving it a sinister edge. Booting up 2004's Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, you're quickly met with its menu music, one of the greatest examples of this style. It's ominous, nasty, unsettling, creepy, but hypnotizing as if someone or something is trying to coax you into starting that new game. It sounds like otherworldly dark powers are revving up and coming for you. It makes it a thrilling prospect to step into the unknown and see if you can survive it. This premise is where the potential of Metroid is at its strongest for me. The idea of descending into a place humans weren't supposed to tread, into spaces with alien ecosystems and technology that defy science and reality as we know it, encountering eldritch horrors light years away. An interactive medium is a great space in which to create this kind of experience, and with an emphasis on solitary exploration through labyrinthian maps where you collect alien tech that helps you both explore further and survive, Metroid, the series, has always especially been uniquely positioned to deliver on this. To some degree, it usually does within the technical limits on offer at the time. Echoes is probably the Metroid game that capitalizes on this aspect of the franchise the most, which is why it's one of my favorites. It delivers aesthetically, contextually, and mechanically on maximizing the thrill of this type of experience. Focusing on this aspect, the journey, the descent into the unknown, is something I wish this series would put a major focus on for as long as it exists. When contact with a team of soldiers in pursuit of pirates goes dark on planet Aether, the government sends in independent contractor Samus Aran to find out what happened. Samus comes equipped with proprietary battle armor gifted to her by a race of ancient, highly evolved bird people. It can morph Samus into a ball and double jump. The soldiers have been wiped out completely, some of them are being reanimated, and Samus gets sucked into a parallel dimension with corrosive air where an evil version of herself sicks a group of monsters on her. It's all kicking off, basically. Echoes is one of the most satisfying single player journeys out there, and it all begins by chucking you into a cave full of zombies with no idea what's going on and stripping you of all your abilities. It places you at the rock bottom of the food chain and what remains of this ecosystem. The title doesn't start with a bang, but with a crawl, and crawl you will in Metroid here as you proceed battered and confused through the dead. Things begin to make a little more sense when Samus stumbles into a mysterious temple suspended in the air, and retrieves some unidentifiable alien tech from the remains of a monster trying to break in she kills. Inside this giant temple, you'll meet a friendly alien called Umos, hiding here from the chaos with what remains of his species, who are frozen in suspended animation. He manages to offer some context. The dark creatures known as the Ing, who killed the soldiers and took your abilities, are fighting for control of the planet with the previous occupants, the Luminoth a group of moth-like aliens who keep their planet habitable through four energy converters. The Ing showed up when a meteor crashed on the planet, not just bringing the creatures with it, but hitting the planet with such force it broke reality and split the world into two dimensions. The original light side, and now a dark world the Ing inhabit. Using the mysterious tech Samus retrieved from the creature in the temple, they intended on gaining control of the energy from the four energy converters to divert all the 
planet's energy towards their dark dimension, stabilizing their reality while eliminating the light reality. The Ing are already in possession of the energy from three of them, with the last one located here in this temple. So all that remained for them to have complete control of the planet and win this war was for that Ing we just killed to reach the next room. I gotta say, it's definitely cool to stumble onto a planet and unwittingly prevent its occupation about five minutes before it was about to be complete by just doggedly choosing to keep surviving there no matter what. Samus, now in possession of this energy siphoning tech, must use it to reclaim the planet energy the Ing have stolen from those three lost energy converters. Not so conveniently for her, the Ing have it stashed in three energy converters of their their own throughout Dark Aether, each in a different major region. Now, in most Metroid titles before this one, the game usually starts with an uplifting jig or bop to get you excited for the adventure after Samus lands at her destination, and if it doesn't kick in then so as to provide an initially unsettling atmosphere, it will kick in around the time you enter the first major level or area. Metroid Prime 2 is different. You start with ominous, unsettling music, and you're welcomed to the first major level, the Aegon Wastes, with no fanfare, just a desolate drone for a backing track. This doesn't just bring out the stark barren nature of the wastes themselves, but puts into perspective that there's no hint of a jolly adventure here. In Echoes, you're on the back foot to such a degree this time around, even 40 minutes into the game with your mission well underway, the game's background music is still saying, yeah, good luck with that. You can show up and delay an invading force occupying one last room, but repelling them single-handedly is going to be an almost hopeless task. Mechanically, the game hammers home this point by stepping up the challenge from past entries. To make it to the energy converters, you're going to have to dip in and out of your current reality to the Ing's dark version of the planet. Here, the air can kill you. Standing in Dark Aether will deplete your health at an alarming rate. The Luminoff have set up beacons which will protect you from the toxic environment if you stand next to them. Both contextually and mechanically, this whole Dark World scenario ups the tension significantly. Jumping through to the twisted Dark World the first time you play Echoes is daunting. You dread having to step in there. You're going to have to fight, explore, figure out where to go while the atmosphere itself tries to kill you. If Metroid excelled at conveying isolation and claustrophobia in the past, Echo's Dark World ratchets things up even further. It's one thing to be alone on an alien planet light years from help. It's another to be there and in another separate reality that repels you if you merely stand in it. A lot of the reason the tension of the Dark World works is also because of how the save system works here. Save rooms double as checkpoints. If you die, you go back to the last one you saved at, and they're scarce enough to make you consider your next move carefully. The charge beam's ability to attract health and ammo pickups gains further functionality in Prime 2. It can be useful for getting pickups without leaving the sanctuary of one of those protective light bubbles in the dark world. The way health is handled in Prime also I think only works with this harsh checkpoint system. You can find pickups that over the course of the game will give you a ridiculously long health bar. Outside of bosses, no single fight is likely to get you killed. This game wants its challenge to be derived from surviving in a hostile environment, and to do that, it reduces the importance of individual battles. The battle is getting from one save point to the next in one piece, having accomplished something on the way. Boss battles maintain their challenge by either being far away from the previous save as well, simply hitting hard, or by forcing you into lengthy encounters with multiple phases. I enjoy these lengthier fights, and I think they fit with the world of the game. You're fighting colossal, otherworldly monstrosities that no human was meant to even interact with. Whittling them down to nothing should also be a colossal task, a real war of attrition. Prime really puts the player in the shoes of the underdog, the human trespassing in the realm of the gods, with the way it crafts its in-suit first-person perspective. 
In a lot of first person games, it's easy to feel less like you're seeing from the eyes of the character, and more like you're seeing the world through a camera strapped to the character's face. Prime overcomes that by making you not play as just a person, but a person in a big metal power armor. You're seeing from behind a visor. When alien gunk splatters cover the TV screen in other first person games, it looks bad because blotches splashing on a flat panel isn't what people see when something gets in their eyes. From behind a visor in a game though, it looks great. It makes use of the fact you're playing the game on a screen to deliver a convincing effect. There's something very compelling about seeing this world through this lens. Knowing that the only thing protecting you from a deadly atmosphere is some metal and a bit of plastic covering your face. Little extra touches complete the effect. The way you get to see your eyes reflected in the visor after a nearby blast is an obvious one, but other tinier incidental touches go a long way too. Samus landing from a big jump causing a thud sound and shaking the screen makes the weight and heft of the power armor clear. Leaving her idle and seeing her head slightly bob sells that there's a living breathing human in that suit too. Cool immersion coveting visual and auditory touches, of course aren't all interfacing with this world from within power armor is good for. It also allows for the seamless integration of mechanics, such as switching lenses for different circumstances. Using different lenses to see what the human eye can't is of course a great advantage the power armor gives Samus, but it's also cool to see the game use her reliance on this technology against her. Like when an enemy downloads a virus into your suit, tanking the frame rate of your visual feed and forcing you to reboot the suit's operating system. It's great how far these games go to make the power suit you're in feel like a tangible tool you're making use of and not just an aesthetic element made to make your space person look cool on the box art. While air that kills you and enemies with targeted frame drop attacks will test your survival skills, it could be argued that your navigation and puzzle skills aren't tested nearly to the same level as they now could be, given the changes to design elsewhere. You'll be jumping back and forth between the light and dark world a lot, but there's not much interplay between the two realities mechanically. They overlap each other on the map, but that rarely matters outside of moments where the path forward is blocked in one reality, forcing you to jump to the other to progress. There are a few instances where using a device will activate something in the opposite reality, but that's simply a case of jumping to the other world and using it there. It's very obviously telegraphed when that needs to be done. You see that the device to open a door or something is in the other dimension, so you jump over to use it there. It's not much of a puzzle, and I think the developers knew that because even these sort of instances are fairly few and far between. I think the reality is though that complex dual world puzzles and challenges requiring switching back and forth multiple times seem fairly unviable in Prime 2. When you consider that while relatively fast, it still takes several seconds to load in the opposing environment. I can imagine having to jump back and forth quickly and repeatedly for some complex puzzle getting annoying. This puts Prime 2's dual world design at a disadvantage compared to games that can switch back and forth instantly because of their visuals or hardware they're on. It's easy therefore to criticize the dark world and echoes with the concept's full mechanical potential untapped here but that doesn't take away from how good its inclusion is for me. Sure, the dark world overlaps with the light world, and a few things done in one world affects the other, but to me that comes secondary to its purpose of raising the stakes and challenge, creating the oppressive atmosphere that it does. It's an extension of the main game world that adds an oppressive edge to this journey. It's what helps make your quest through Aether as daunting and challenging and thrilling as it is, and that's great regardless. Duality is at the core of Prime 2, as you'd expect from a game called Echoes, both mechanically and contextually. The Luminoth are essentially giant moths, fans of the light, while their counterparts, the Ing, are parasites and predominantly take the form of these arachnid-like aliens that burrow into the ground and hide from the light in the shadows. The Ing stealing the Luminoth's light energy and using it against them is fitting. Moths, of course, can often get burnt by the very light they pine for. 
The Galactic Federation and their counterparts, the Space Pirates, make an appearance in this game too. Both have opposing goals and ethics, but are quick to make rash decisions and not fully understand just how in over their heads they are. We have the light and dark world, but we also have the light and dark beams. Two weapons that complement each other, with certain enemies being more susceptible to one or the other. One burns, one freezes, and enemies killed with one will drop ammo for the opposing beam. It all adds a nice little extra layer of strategy to the combat this time around. And of course, there's Dark Samus. After infiltrating a space pirate settlement in the wastes, Samus comes across Dark Samus again, stealing a powerful energy source phase on from them. This time though, it's on. The fight here is a simple one where it's merely about blasting Dark Samus enough before she blasts you enough. But I think this fits this first bout with her. It's like a duel between two gunslingers, a war of attrition, where you're not trying to prove you can outsmart or trick Dark Samus, but that you have the grit to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her through sheer strength and battle technique alone, and come out on top. Her battle music fits her perfectly, as it's ominous and sinister, but with a frantic pace to reflect the doppelganger's chaotic demeanor. It also has a sick electric guitar solo, cause those are radical, and this is a cool fight. I also like how this fight takes place on neutral ground, the space pirate base on Aether. The area they're in gets torn to shreds as the battle goes on, and it's fun to imagine the space pirates looking on in horror at this fight happening essentially in their living room. The duelists battling on without a single moment of consideration for what they're destroying around them. This is another aspect of Prime 2 I really like. The amount of different factions and players on Aether and how, through the scan system, you can learn about all of them and their perspective on events. Piecing the story together yourself. Prime's move to take this franchise about exploring and collecting items and add more story into the mix by making that story a series of collectibles as well is a great choice. Much like how you piece Samus's power suit together by finding things in the environment, through the scan system you piece together the events of the game by doing the same. I think Prime 2 is where this system shines the most, thanks to the variety of different perspectives you come across here. One of my favorite little stories the log system helps with is the failed Dark Samus Space Pirate collab event. Halfway into the game, you can find out that the pirates saw the first altercation between you and Dark Samus. And while they are horrified to discover there are two Samuses, they hope to use your conflict with her against you by brokering a deal with Dark Samus. The phase on energy she craved from their base in exchange for your life. Before the second fight with Dark Samus, you can see what looks like the pirates attempting to carry out that very deal they mentioned. And it doesn't go well for them. It gives the world a nice added touch of realism that the pirates are observing what you're doing and have a scheme like this going on in the background when you're not around shooting at them. I also like the scans you can read from the Galactic Federation troopers. They give more context on how they were picked off by the Ing, with some added flavor in the form of two scans referencing an argument over whether accounts of Samus's feats are accurate. It adds a nice little extra layer of texture to this universe to know that your actions in prior games are a subject of conversation throughout the societies of this fiction. Some idealize you, some are skeptical of you, and some are afraid of you. The Luminoff end up coming off very sympathetic, with recent battles having happened all over the planet, their corpses litter the game. Scanning them will reveal how they met their tragic end. You'll learn about Luminoff who decided to end their lives rather than be possessed by the Ing, or even family members who died in close proximity. It really makes you want to stop those who caused this. Many elements make the world of Echoes compelling to explore, and one of them is just the sheer variety of things to see. The Primes go hard on making almost every 
every room have some kind of unique alien looking asset to look at, which is what makes this series feel like they're the definitive games about, well, exploring. That the environment remains so realistically diverse and enticing to discover and ponder. It's so cool. Even each save room in this game you go into has a unique look, which is something even this franchise doesn't always do. I really like the cold, washed out look of Prime 2. It really fits the dark mood of the game and the solitary quest you're on. This is my favorite look for the power suit. I feel like it's more dull, metallic look here highlights its purpose as a tool for getting a job done, rather than as some awe-inspiring piece of iconography we, the player, should be reverent of that's trying to draw attention to itself. It's a dependable tool, but the look accentuates that it's the human within, with resolve and nerve, that's getting the job done at the end of the day. The Aegon Wastes are a pretty oppressive place to spend the first third of the game. You'll spend your time there at the mercy of the Dark World's atmosphere, receiving heavy damage for moving around areas within it. If you're scrappy enough and get through both Dark Samus and the pirates, though, the first major boss awaits against a Morbis, a giant worm, or series of worms, I guess, who guards the first energy converter's power. Unlike some of the later bosses, this boss doesn't have much of a puzzle element to it, but it's still engaging both visually and in terms of challenge. The giant worms in this fight have a startling sense of scale when they're combining their strength to create some ultra mega beam. You'll be in the dark world too, so you'll have to take into consideration where is best to dodge, since being out of the light pockets, you'll be taking major damage. Amorbus can even disable the pockets for a short time, making for a pretty hectic fight. There's an excitement to this battle, knowing that if you can just take this thing down, scramble from safe zone to safe zone at the right time, and make it through, you can make your first real dent in the Ing Horde. Your reward for sticking it out till here is the Dark Suit. Samus not only co-ops Luminoff tech here, but also their aesthetic. The Dark Suit doesn't stop you taking damage from the Dark World's atmosphere, but reduces damage taken significantly when subjected to it. Finally, evening the odds a little. Light pockets are still something you're going to want to stay in, but you can take more risks now being able to spend more time out of them. The second major area is the Torvus Bog, a swampland filled with streams and vegetation intermingling with the technology of the Luminoff. Just walking into this area provides us with a great example of how well thought out and directed the Prime games are. You come down the lift into this unknown place, the soundtrack quiet as you walk through the first few corridors. Only when you walk out into the first large area of the Torvus Bog does the level's theme kick in. theme that starts slowly, but grows more confident as it settles in. Much like how you might be growing at this point in the adventure. The Torvus Bog theme is still understated and downbeat. But unlike previous level themes in this game, you can start to feel this track is getting a bit more of a groove on. It slightly hints at a more upbeat tone, reflecting where the player is currently at in the adventure. With the Dark Suit and the first energy converter online, you finally have a bit of a grip on the situation here. There's still a lot to accomplish, this track knows that, but it also knows that at last, you're getting a groove on yourself. You're starting to feel a bit more yourself here. The act of exploring this world has become slightly less daunting. You're getting back into feeling more comfortable once again, being Samus Aran, planet cartographer. And what's noteworthy is that this feeling that usually kicks in pretty quickly in a Metroid game only happens in Echoes like a full third the way into the title. And there's still a lot of tension and uncertainty in the air. 
Torvus has a terrific, melancholic atmosphere that epitomizes Metroid, I think. Being out alone in a dark, dangerous place that is at once both hostile, yet beautiful. Hanging in there on your own in a lonely, isolated place, but persevering and not letting that knock your determination. A lot of that hope in Prime 2 gets sucked straight out of the game whenever you enter the dark world as the soundtrack gets reduced to unsettling hums and drones and makes it feel like the air is thinner here. <laughs> I like how the Dark World's version of Torvus turns the roots of the trees into what almost looks like wires corrupting the environment. Deeper into Torvus, there are these submerged tunnels that perhaps lack the visual splendor of the upper areas, but make up for it a little by playing a beautiful new rendition of the lower Brinstar theme from Super Metroid. <laughs> A real calming classic, which the level definitely needs once you discover you'll be moving pretty slowly down here for the most part, until you get the gravity boost. I'm glad that Echoes doesn't have a soundtrack that coasts on using music from previous Metroid games, but I think one or two returning tracks is fine. Lower Brinstar is just a perfect fit while being down here. You'll also be facing a boss which is relatively far from a save point. Dying to this boss can cost you a significant amount of playtime. I'm not against a challenge like that in principle, but making the level you have to redo one where you're moving slower and having the fight not be some tense showdown with an ultimate foe where you could really feel that tension adding to things, but a shootout with a big slug, I feel creates a mismatch between the intensity of this situation gameplay-wise and its context. I think one of the most intense, stressful parts of this game shouldn't be a fight against a big swamp slug. The boss guarding the second energy converter is Chika. It has two stages, but I'm a much bigger fan of the first. The weird kidney-looking monster of Phase 1 just has a much more intimidating, alien abomination look to it than its transformation with its giant wasp appearance. Big wasps are probably the one type of enemy Metroid overdoes. Rather than being this dynamic, frantic fight like Amorbis, this one requires you to be a little more measured. Using your radar to be ready for a counterattack when the lava form emerges from the toxic lake, and later knowing where to position yourself just right to cripple the wasp form's wings with the new multi-missile lock. I'm a big fan of small directorial touches like the boss music kicking in during the pre-boss fight cutscene. Just gets you pumped and psyched to get into the fight here as the music builds before the cut to gameplay. Sanctuary Fortress is where the third and final converter is hidden. There's a much more energetic mood up here, which is fitting given that the tide is starting to turn in your favor. The music in this area is more energetic, but so is the environment itself. Robots performing maintenance buzz around, machinery spins, tiny bug bots move and scatter across the walls. Outside, what I can only describe as reverse cyber rain moves up, perhaps pushing the level and keeping it afloat. What's surprising about Echoes is how much gameplay gets squeezed out of the morph ball this time around. Even though it doesn't come equipped with new abilities, the scope of its use has increased compared to the previous Prime, with two boss fights being purely Morph Ball encounters, one focusing on clever bomb timing and the other on efficient use of Spider Ball tracks. It's good to see the Morph Ball not included out of obligation, but expanded upon with plenty of creative implementation here. The main boss of Sanctuary Fortress, Quadraxis, probably pushes the Morph Ball to its highest heights. After crippling this gigantic machine, you then Spider Ball up its leg so you can Boost Ball onto its floating brain and drop a bomb in it. It's such cool and creative boss design. Contextually and mechanically, this use of the Morph Ball is badass. The moment you realize the game is actually expecting you to do this, it's hard not to let slip a smirky grin. 
Before fighting Quadraxis, though, you'll gain access to some cool new abilities, like the Echo Visor, acquired after beating Dark Samus for a second time. The helmet view in Prime lends itself very well to a visor based around Echo Location, allowing you to see and disrupt signals being used by the enemy. The puzzles you solve with it aren't very complex, but we'll give that a pass, since throwing the ability to see with sound into your game is not something I'm gonna scoff at either way, especially when it looks this cool. The ability also carries the title's name, and at the end of the game, we'll be seeing that not go ignored. Remember, its purpose is to let you see echoes. The screw attack makes its first appearance in 3D Metroid, and you'd think a first-person game letting you triple jump into a third-person perspective to bounce off walls would be a terrible, janky idea. But Echoes just kinda does it, and it works fine, so I guess all us armchair designers should just stop speculating about what theoretically should or shouldn't work in game design. Just like with the Morph Ball, Prime doesn't shackle itself to one perspective for consistency if a better perspective for the task at hand exists. Remember, real players don't play, they invent the game. With the three Guardian bosses down and the planetary energy they were guarding back in your hands, once again powering the Light World, the Ing are now on the back foot. It's time to enter their hive and destroy their Emperor, and reclaim the last of the planetary energy it's clinging onto. But to do that, you're going to need one final ability. All three converters under your control power up together to grant you the Light Suit. The Light Suit negates all damage caused by the Dark World's atmosphere, and the game understands the enormity of earning this ability, with the most opulent and striking item acquisition scene yet. And with this, your victory lap begins. To gain access to the Emperor Ing's lair, you'll need to collect nine temple keys scattered around the game world, some of which are only accessible with your light suit. It's immense just how different it feels to walk around the game world now compared to at the start. Going from being pushed around, even the air being damaging, to having a fully upgraded power suit that decimates enemies and tanks damage, plus that Dark World atmosphere no longer harming you. Well, the hunted has definitely become the hunter. Going about this victory lap, you're the apex predator. It's easy to almost feel bad for the Ing you encounter now, because they just stand zero chance when you stride into a room. Starting off at the mercy of the Dark World, a crushing obstacle to overcome, and reaching this point where it can no longer affect you is immensely satisfying, and after all you've been through, it feels earned here. Up until here in Echoes, you spend most of your time dealing with one third of the game world at a time. Aegon Wastes, Torvus Bog, and then Sanctuary Fortress. But now, during the key hunt, they get to form one giant hole. Using the knowledge you now have of these three areas, you'll have to find new shortcuts and jump between each region efficiently. You get some clues as to where the keys are hidden that refer to the room they're located in, so this final scavenger hunt doesn't just let you flex the power you've gained, but your knowledge of this world's layout as well. Metroid is all about exploring, but also about being observant while doing so. Once you gain a new power-up or ability, you have to recall what you've seen to figure out where it could be used. The Victory Lab is this challenge, but expanded to its largest scale yet in this title. It's satisfying to draw upon your experience to effectively track down these keys. Someone unfamiliar with this now fully interconnected massive map would find such a task daunting, but for you at this stage, it's a chance to demonstrate you've mastered this environment. It's also a good time to get any extra stray collectible upgrades before the final boss. Before I get to the finale, I'd like to rattle off a few extra little details this game includes that I think make it a little more special. The dark beam will turn off protective bubbles, and the light beam will power them up. But once you get the annihilator beam, which combines dark and light ammo together, shooting a bubble's crystal will make it go a hellish red and suck enemies into it to be eradicated. When Umos is telling you before visiting the Torvus Bog for the first time that he's seen greater numbers of Ing congregating there, he's not pulling this info from nowhere. There are little Luminoff cameras in Torvus that he uses to gather this info. Later in the game, you can return to the Galactic Federation landing site where some space pirates are investigating the same logs you looked at earlier 
on how the feds met their unfortunate end. Guess they're curious too. The pirates bring some Metroids with them to Aether, and once things go south, they start breaking loose. You can see Metroids feeding on their once captors in Dark Aether, as well as on one very unfortunate pirate being toyed with in their enclosure. In the first room of the game where you touch down in your ship, the place looks deserted. Later on, you'll find a deceased Luminoff was in that very room, hidden behind some blocks on a higher ledge. Gives me a shudder to think there was a dead native right there the whole time. Echoes includes an optional hint system contextualized in-game as a scan your suit is doing to find hidden technology. It will give you a general idea of where to go next if you're stumbling around lost for too long. A nice touch is that it will refer to the item it's detected as Luminoth technology if it's new, but if it's one of the powers stolen by the Ing at the start of the title, the scan will refer to it as Chozo Technology, the bird creators of Samus's original power suit. Turn into a morph ball and you can see little bugs get attracted by its glow. I mean, you gotta love that. This is a very detailed title. The only touch I wish they had added would have been more dynamic animations when transitioning out of the morph ball. Samus just looks like a bit of a dork sometimes when you do this in game. Some like badass aerial landing animation could have been cool when transforming back into human mode in midair. Once all the keys are collected, you can enter the Dark Sky Temple where the Emperor Ing guards the last of the planetary energy. As is befitting of the final boss for such a long game, it's a three-part encounter that asks you to make use of the full breadth of your offensive capabilities. The first phase has you circle strafe around a stationary target, the second, Morph Ball style, you've got to bomb the enemy's giant cocoon before it emerges into its final phase, a giant spider-like monstrosity that charges around the arena. One of my favorite attacks from the first form is the Emperor's ability to open mini portals to the Light Realm and then back to the Dark Worlds to get its tentacles closer to you. It's sick, it shows how powerful the Ultimate Ing is. I also wonder if Umos can see the tentacles popping out on his side. I do like how even in the final boss, the Morph Ball gets a workout. It's good to see your full moveset made use of here. I think the way the fight builds is really great. It's like you start the fight and the Emperor Ing is all confident, proud, and standing its ground. But once you batter it, it retreats into its shell, only for you to go, nah, nah, nah. At this point, after all this work, you ain't getting away. Everything you've done, all the hardship you've suffered on Aether, was in service of getting you into this one room with this one foe, who's finally on the back foot. And the game acknowledges this by dropping the title's main theme. No longer as an ominous tune to draw you in when you boot up the game. But now as a triumphant final call to battle. taken the entire game, but this is the first boss theme with a real sense of triumph to it. It's still frantic and fast-paced enough though to give you that feeling that victory isn't quite yours, but it's so close you can taste it. The rhythm of the fight reflects that, too. The Emperor's final form is strong and imposing, but its wide, gaping mouth, with its final weak point exposed within it, just gives off this sense that it's finally truly vulnerable. Wailing consecutive fire into it as it recoils is extremely satisfying. Seeing the thing responsible for your and everybody else's pain on this planet recoil in fear of you is euphoric. The Emperor Ing fight is like the entire game condensed down into one fight. It starts off disorienting and daunting, but you compose yourself, get your bearings, and then show it who's in charge. It's one of the most satisfying final bosses, and it would be a great ending on its own. But Echoes goes one step further. It's easy to be on such a high defeating the Emperor Ing that you may forget there's still a loose end to all of this. Dark Samus. 
With the Emperor defeated and the planetary energy he was holding on to yours, the Dark World has no energy left and is collapsing. And this is when Dark Samus decides to pop up again for one last showdown. You may have forgotten about her for a moment after beating the Emperor, but the second she appears, it feels entirely inevitable. Even they seem to know that. The classic Metroid Escape Countdown level music from the first game becomes a boss theme here while you duke it out as the dimension crumbles in on itself. Completionists of the original Prime game will already have surmised that Dark Samus is the Metroid Prime, Samus defeated at that title's conclusion, somehow having managed to meld with her DNA while it was dying to survive. In Prime 2, many things point towards this too, such as scanning her revealing her genetic makeup contains your DNA, logs where the pirates claim to have observed Dark Samus chilling with Metroids, or just the fact that she would much rather float than use her legs, Metroid style. Here though, her face revealed with three soulless eyes, reminiscent of the three ball-like organs on display every time Samus bumps into the titular Metroid during her life. Well, I like to think this is maybe where Samus herself puts all the pieces together and figures out what Dark Samus probably is. A shadow that wasn't cast by the war on Aether, but one from her own past. I think in that moment it would become obvious to her that this long quest defeating Dark counterparts in this title was never going to be over until she vanquished her own. This one is her mess to clean up. I love this kind of scenario where the main antagonist is dealt with at the end of the game, only for the true final boss to be against your rival, who has similar abilities and whose greatest ambition is to see who's best between you. It's as if to say the ultimate challenge is always going to be besting yourself. Here, there's no better battle to end the game on than this, as it brings things full circle. The title started off by having Dark Samus own you, and proving to her that that was a mistake makes for a satisfying final victory on Aether. In the second fight with Dark Samus earlier, you had to use the Dark Visor to see her when she activated her camouflage. Here at the end, Evolved, the Dark Visor no longer lets you see when she hides like this. In probably Echo's definitive moment, you have to activate the Echo's Visor to track her when she turns invisible here. In this moment, the Echo Visor is being used for its ultimate purpose, to track your own Echo, so you can kill it and put this whole game's battle with dark doppelgangers to bed for good. It's easy to play Metroid for a bit and get the idea that Samus is some stone-cold, emotionless, empty vessel. But the reality is we spend most of the time with her when she's on the job. She doesn't have time to goof off, she's focused and determined, while fundamentally in places she doesn't belong. But the split second the job is done, she's pumping her hand into the air as she flies out of a crippled dimension and cheekily waving goodbye to an ancient civilization of alien wizards whose respect she's forever earned. Echoes is one of the darker, harder journeys Samus Aran takes part in. So just how casual she is taking off, like this was no big deal, just another job in the can, really adds insult to injury on these jokers who thought she was easy prey. In the grand scheme of Samus's life, they were just another mission accomplished. Samus's attitude in these games, far from being a unnoteworthy blank slate, captures a lot of the soul of the primes for me. There's a careful, patient, calculated determination in how she approaches even the most dire circumstances or daunting situation. She carefully goes about figuring out what she needs to do, and then methodically and deliberately takes the steps needed to execute. Contrast that with her Echo Dark Samus, who acts erratically and on impulse, hedonistically consuming. And while she takes Samus off guard at first, she can't match Aran's modus operandi. I think there's always an inclination to want the media that matters to us to take a turn into outward emotion and on-the-sleeve earnestness to somehow validate the time and respect we have for what we enjoy, to reflect our passion for it in that way. But I don't think Metroid is a series that would benefit much from that direction. The way Samus, and by extension the player, succeed in these dark, crushing scenarios is by keeping emotion and impulse in check. 
Power armor, beams, double jumps, they alone aren't why Samus Aran can succeed. It's that state of mind that keeps her alive. Her inquisitive yet calm and controlled approach to things. Echoes makes this cool-headed approach to problem-solving all the more inspiring, as calm perseverance manages to mend such a dire situation here. A situation that on your arrival was minutes away from being unrepairable. It says that that spirit can lead you to success even when setting off from one of gaming's most demoralizing starting points and bring things back from the brink. The way we connect with the events of Metroid isn't via some tearful scene between characters or learning about some tragic backstory that happened off screen. It's about the journeys and stories we experience in the adventure while playing the game. The rivalry we as a player build with Dark Samus as she gets in our way. The way villains in the series put us, the player, through hell in gameplay with elements like the Dark World. And how we fight on to make them regret it. The Prime games with their in-suits perspective accentuates that angle. It's about you, the player, going on these journeys and growing these relationships between you and the pirates, the Ing. Dark Samus, and the villains in prior games. Much less emphasis in the Primes is placed on the backstory of Samus and her connections formed prior to the games. But that really works in a game about feeling alone and insignificant in the bowels of an alien place and fighting to survive. The legend that matters isn't anything that happened before the game, it's the one you create when picking up the controller. When such an insignificant part of the universe, one human in a floating tin can, stumbles by chance into an otherworldly conflict and chooses to step into that darkness and not be broken by it. While Metroid Prime is technically in this game in the form of Dark Samus, and the classic Metroid creatures do appear as an enemy to encounter here, here and there, Metroids aren't at the center of this story. The Ing and the Luminoth catalyze the events, and you play as Samus Aran, a human. But remember, in the Chozo's language, Metroid means ultimate warrior. So whether the Metroid creature even makes an appearance or not in a Metroid game, it doesn't matter, because these games aren't about a floating jellyfish. They're about being the ultimate warrior. And few games will make you feel like one more by the end than Metroid Prime 2 Echoes.